going to begin the digital twin industry session. As usual, please uh, keep your micro off and uh, take a seat, of course. If you have any technical problem, use the private chat or use the public chat if you want to ask questions um, before the end of the, of the talk. Also use the, the public chat. Mark, stage is yours. Yeah, thanks, Gregory. Hi, everybody. Um, oh, wow. Uh, it's an honor for me uh, being here with, with you. Um, I think that Laval Virtual uh, World, it's, it, it, it's awesome. Uh, it's a great success. And for me, it's even a, a higher success being here on stage introducing this uh, new conference about digital twin. Uh, first, let me introduce myself. Um, I'm Marc Branguier. I'm leading the augmented reality business at uh, PTC. Um, and I think we know what uh, we are talking about at PTC uh, when we talk about um, digital twin. Um, but yesterday, um, I, I was preparing uh, this introduction and saying to myself, hey, how I can introduce in, in, uh, digi the digital twin uh, conference? Uh, and I said to myself, come on, what is a digital twin? Uh, and I think that's mainly uh, the first uh, question. And I just made a taste. Uh, I saw a lot of, uh, of your avatars on LinkedIn and uh, I, I see them like mushroom uh, bumpings. And I said, hey, is my avatar a digital twin of myself? That's why I wanted to share uh, my picture. Well, it's my current picture uh, with uh, now two months at home uh, <laughs> without the permission to uh, to go out. So Bob um, might be a little bit fat. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, but is my avatar a digital tweet? Some of you will say yeah. Some of you will say no. So I said, OK. Let's have a look about what is digital twin. And I went through uh, internet, uh, I had discussion with people and I, uh, and I found uh, a great, a first great definition in 2012 about digital twin. And it's coming from uh, the NASA and the US Air Force. And to be honest, I didn't know that digital twin was coming from this sector. Um, I think that uh, aerospace and defense are pretty uh, one of the early adopters of new technology. And as you see in, in 2012, it was a pretty complex definition. And if you see uh, in 2018, the new definition, it's pretty simple um, because I think that it's now easier to understand what is a digital twin. A digital twin it's a 100% replica, replica uh, of a physical element. Um, I, I think that I, I'm used to, uh, to in my pitch, to use a lot of, uh, a lot of videos because for me, one image was uh, 1,000 words. So I, I will try to launch this one uh, otherwise, I will share with you uh, the content. Uh, it's a pretty simple one showing what is digital trade. Um, digital trade mainly is everywhere now. It's coming from the aerospace, but jumping in any sector of the economy. Yeah, the NASA started with it, but now you have also in uh, oil and gas, um, you have it in automotive, you have it for beam. You can comment the video, Mark, because we can hear the sound. Yeah, uh, you don't see the video? 
it's always difficult to stream a video okay, inside okay, this okay. world. So um, mainly this video is about the concept of digital twin and showing that digital twin is everywhere now and can be everywhere. And I think it's important for us in a Nixar uh, world. Some of you are doing virtual, uh, virtual reality, some of us are augmented reality, mixed reality. Uh, at the end of the day, we are all concerned about digital twin because uh, what we are providing to end customer is based on the digital twin. It's based on the data used uh, for creating um, elements or 3D assets, for example. And I think that's, that's here uh, the key of everything. Data is the center of the digital twin. It's the center at the end of the day of what we are doing on virtual worlds. <clears throat> augmented or uh, virtual, whatever, data is the center of everything. If we don't have data, we are not able to um, we are not able to do good digital twin. Digital twin is just a representation of the data. Just what is the digital representation of a physical information? So, at the end of the day, it's like for any XR experience, data is key, and digital twin. For me, um, talking about digital twin is also talking about uh, digital continuity. XR will be a way of just consulting the data or interact with the data. But at the end of the day, if the data is wrong, everything after will be wrong. That's why digital twin goes with digital continuity and i hope that all the pitch you will have uh, today will uh, help you to have cr concrete example of uh, digital twin in our uh, xr uh, world and also um, to help you to drive your project to success that's all for me um, on this introduction feel free to contact me if you if you want um i will come back on stage to talk about uh one end customer that is using digital twin on our augmented reality for quality check um so now gregory the stage is yours thanks a lot everybody and enjoy thanks mark uh next speaker is caroline Come, Caroline. So, um, so, my name is Caroline Bayard, and I'm uh, leading the Mixed Reality Research Team at Inter Digital. So, maybe some of you are not familiar with Inter Digital because it's quite a new name within the XR community. Uh, actually, there was a presentation yesterday about uh, volumetric video given by one of my colleagues. So, if you attended this presentation, you know who you are. But for those who don't, I will start with a quick overview of the company, and then I will focus on our activities uh, related to mixed reality. So, uh, InterDigital is actually uh, one of the largest uh, research and innovation uh, licensing company. We've been working on, uh, on wireless for more than uh, four decades, uh, and recently expanded to consumer electronics uh, with research on uh, video and artificial intelligence and uh, visiting today in one of the largest patent portfolio uh, related to wireless and video technology. So, uh, InterDigital is organized into labs, doing research on 5G, video technology, and also IoT. Uh, this lab strongly contributes to international standards. Uh, they also support customer partnerships, the new solution based on our research, like typically edge computing, immersive video, synthetic content, uh, and also explore new markets uh, and new research topics. Concretely, there are several uh, R&D centers uh, located both in Europe and America with approximately 350 uh, researchers and engineers. Uh, so one of these centers is based in uh, Rennes in France, so not far from Laval, and this is where I come from. So in fact, our activities based on video uh, are not new at all. Uh, last year, we acquired the research and innovation organization from uh, in Technicolor, 
which had a, a long research history on video topics. And so this enabled NPR Digital to immediately become a, a key player in the video and immersive technologies, so including uh, video and point cloud compression, VR, AR, like film, digital double, uh, et cetera. Concretely, it's organized into four labs. There is the wireless and networking labs, the image science lab, the artificial intelligence lab, and uh, the immersive lab, which deals uh, with uh, AR and VR technologies. Uh, among other topics. So now, for more precisely, uh, the immersive lab, so which is based in REN, uh, has the goal to develop uh, core technologies to create a new immersive experiences. Uh, it's organized into four key research areas. Uh, there is the virtual production one, which develops technology for VFX and gaming. There is the mixed reality one, which will be the topic of the presentation. Volumetric imaging uh, works on technologies for volumetric video and light guiding. And finally, deep content, which explores solution uh, for, the generation, for the generation of synthetic content uh, based on uh, deep learning. So now, before going into more details about our research activities related to mixed reality, I would like to focus uh, on a couple of uh, market, market trends uh, which are important. Uh, first, uh, consumer-based augmented reality is becoming more and more important. So AR now has been already been successfully used in uh, many industries for a few years, like for maintenance, training, healthcare, etc. Uh, it's also been used for consumer application based on phones mainly, for gaming, for instance, and navigation. Uh, it's true that the consumer adoption has been made complicated by limits, both in hardware devices and software technologies. Uh, but this is quickly evolving at the moment with the arrival of new players and also a uh, new tool. Uh, and for instance, typically at the CES uh, in January this year, um, there was a, an impressive amount of uh, new augmented and mixed reality devices for consumers, uh, as well as many solutions dedicated to consumers as well. So all this indicates that uh, this is now that AR is really extending from a professional application to mass market usages, uh, which can be both uh, indoor or outdoor. The second big trend I wanted to talk about uh, is the rise of the AR cloud. Uh, so it, uh, it's been a key word in the uh, Augmented World Expo since uh, 2018, and it can have various names like Neo World, uh, digital twin, like uh, we're just uh, talking about in this session, also spatial computing platform. Uh, but in fact, all these terms, they all refer to the same thing. We're talking about a digital copy of the real world uh, that enable to share content between multiple users uh, and also over time. And as such, it is really the key for a resilient and shared uh, AR experiences. So there are already uh, several key platforms from consumer uh, based on this concept. Uh, well, there is the Open AR Cloud, which is a non-profit organization which was launched last year. But there are also a six-day AI, which is now part of Niantic. There is Ubiquity 6, uh, Magic Verse for Magic Leap, uh, et cetera. Uh, so of course, there are still many challenges, uh, limiting the massive usage of the AR Cloud right now. Uh, there's a scalability, of course, because it can be huge interoperability, which is a massive, massive issue, uh, connectivity, security, privacy, and, and more. Okay, so now if we go back to research activity at InterDigital uh, related to mixed uh, reality. So the purpose of the mixed reality research area is to develop technologies and workflow uh, to enable next generation mixed reality experiences. And actually this is twofold to us. Uh, one, there is a real need to improve the realism of a mixed reality. It requires to uh, seamlessly blend the virtual elements uh, into a live, view, a live view of the real world environment. Uh, and second, next generation mixed reality experiences uh, must be context aware. That means that uh, automatically adapt uh, to both the environment uh, and the user. In terms of application, uh, we made the choice to focus on the consumer-based applications located indoor. Uh, so indoor means it can be in the home, in the office, uh, in shopping areas or museum, whatever. Uh, so we made that choice not because outdoor is not interesting, on the contrary, 
uh, but in outdoor context involves models and methods which are quite different from indoor, so we would better focus on indoor uh, right now. In terms of uh, application, we identified two categories of application. So the first one is the visual enhancement and personalization of the river environment. Uh, so that includes inserting a virtual object uh, in the real world in a realistic way. Uh, but it can also be removing an object or changing its appearance, for instance. Second category of application, which we believe is also part of mixed reality, uh, enable to interact remotely with real objects or real people. Uh, it can be through the device, of course. Uh, it's like obtaining info about an object, about someone, but it can also be controlling a connected object, for instance, like a lamp, a TV, or, or a robot. So, in order to achieve this, uh, we set up an integral prototyping platform based on a central server that we call AR Hub. Uh, we can actually be compared to a local AR cloud and that we use to experiment uh, our workflows uh, and technologies. So this hub, this central home server, uh, collects data uh, captured by various consumer sensors. It uses this data to build and maintain an advanced uh, representation of the river environment. It's like this is our mirror world. And it shares relevant content to requesting uh, devices and display when, when needed. So because all these data are centralized and managed by a single server, uh, we can benefit, we can naturally benefit from a shared and resilient uh, AR, MR, uh, and we can interact with the real objects. Also, we can have a better quality of experience thanks to the aggregation of multiple input data. We can also propose advanced features like object removal uh, because we have reduced latency thanks to um, the fact that computationally expensive tasks can be performed offline before the experience itself. Uh, and finally, because it's a private ecosystem with all information stored and shared on the local network, it's easier to guarantee privacy and also to have more uh, flexibility in the data management, uh, and typically to customize your, your content uh, and your interaction. Of course, uh, there are many technical challenges associated to this kind of workflow uh, and to mixed reality in general, in fact. Uh, so first, in order to build the mirror world, uh, you need to have a pretty good understanding uh, of the river environment by definition. Hence, you need to do advanced similarities and modeling. So that includes um, 3D geometry. Uh, but also, we need information about the material and the textures. Uh, we need to know the light sources uh, and, of course, the semantics as well. When we've created the digital copy of the real world, this is not uh, done. Then we need to align this digital world with the real one which is equivalent to finding the, the pose of the AI device with respect to the virtual worlds. And so that involves all the techniques for relocalization and tracking. And on the other end, on the wandering side, uh, there are also many key challenges related to time wandering, displays, user interaction. Finally, uh, there are, of course, all the networking issues to address uh, communication and data exchanges. So in this presentation, I will not address, of course, all these technical challenges. I will simply uh, focus on a few technical challenges related to uh, scene modeling and with virtual alignment. So first, let's start with the 3D geometry. Uh, it's a basic need for MR. Uh, it's, really, it's really the basics. Uh, and the geometry must be represented as a 3D point cloud or a 3D mesh. So it is true there are many nowadays existing solutions, and the problem might seem like it's solved, but actually it is not. Uh, on one hand, because of the limited quality of consumer sensors, uh, but also, for instance, indoor, we've got many featureless areas that do not require, it was specularities, it was occasions, and that, so a lot of factors that make the reconstruction uh, still not, not perfect and not as good as, uh, as we would like. So here, yeah, in our workflow, uh, we need to have a high quality mesh stored on the AI hub in order to enable advanced applications. So we chose to use uh, offline processing rather than live 3D. So the 3D model can be obtained either using a depth sensor uh, or just images sent by the phone. So the data uh, is stored, are sent to the hub and uh, computed on the hub. The 3D model is computed uh, and stored on the hub. 
the 3D models can also be sent to mobile device on request for visualization, for instance, or, for, or to be used for something. So the computation time depends on the size, of course, but it generally takes a few minutes, not more, so it's not too long either. Another challenge is texture mapping. So texture is not useful for most AI applications, it is true. But it can be very important for some application uh, like object cloning or object removal, for instance. So to do texture mapping, uh, you can use the image that we use to build the 3D geometry uh, as the camera was is known. But generally, it's not enough uh, because you've got a slight inaccuracy in the camera open estimation. Uh, you've got also uh, radiometric changes between uh, different images, uh, which leads to artifacts in the image. If you look uh, on the image on the right side, you can see artifacts both in geometry and color. So um, in our workflow, we use a property, uh, an internal method that runs on a server uh, based on a 3D mesh and also the keyframe and the uh, initial estimated pose. And then we added two refinement steps, a geometric alignment and a global color correction one. Uh, uh, two seamless textures. So, 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 as you can see on the image on the right here, uh, the artifacts have gone uh, both in uh, geometry and in color. And this way, we've got um, a 3D mesh which, which is textures with uh, seamless images. The third challenge I wanted to talk about is light source characterization. So, this is a part of the analysis that is known and definitely less mature. But and yet it is very important for the realism of mixed reality. So, for instance, when you insert in virtual objects, among real objects, uh, you want the virtual shadows to be consistent with the real one. Um, and similarly, if the virtual object is a little bit shiny, you want the reflections uh, to be consistent with the surrounding lights of the real world environment. So this is a very complicated problem because there are many types of light sources. There's direct and indirect lighting, many parameters. And also, there are different impacts according to the surface characteristics. So it's very complex to, to analyze and to model. Uh, there are several existing solutions, either based on probes, like for the VFX, or uh, image analysis that provide like one value for ambient lighting, for instance. Uh, but they provide limited information. And so again, within our, our concept and our workflow, uh, and thanks to this server-based approach, uh, we can address complex analysis based on images, but also a 3D information. Uh, so here, uh, the light source characterization is performed on the hair hub using both 3D and images. So the images, they're captured by the user device and sent to the hub. Uh, and then you can have uh, offline processing to analyze uh, all this. So we've been working on this topic for, for a while now. Uh, we experimented several methods, some of them based on uh, facial camera analysis, uh, specularity analysis in a video sequence, or cache shadow analysis, which appears so you analyze the, the real shadows of the real objects to infer the, the 3D position and characteristic of the light process, which appear to be the most uh, promising approach. So we've got a few solutions for this, uh, for this analysis as well. So the last technical challenge I wanted to mention here is the device localization, which is uh, sorry for to superimpose visual content to the review. So here there are some strong time constraints because, of course, the pose needs to be estimated in a, quite quickly in an interactive time at least. Uh, there may also be changes between the real world uh, at the moment of the experience and the mirror world as it was captured. Uh, changes both in the geometry, if the lighting changes, if the divide changes, for instance, but also in the geometry, you can have objects disappearing, appearing, move, etc. And of course, again, indoor, you've got uh, many featureless areas, and it's quite difficult to know where you are, for instance, if you're just in front of a big white wall, because it's, it's, this is a real problem. So, to us, we perform a relocalization again on the server. Uh, by comparing uh, request data sent by the device uh, with the reference 3D model and the associated keyframe. Uh, the request data, there can be images, for instance, sent by a phone, but it can also be like a 3D map, uh, typically if it's sent by robots. So, and I'm going to see an example of this uh, just uh, later. The computation is done on the server, and the post information is sent back to the requesting uh, device. And there can also be interactions between the device and the server if the relocalization is not satisfying. So this process is not real-time, 
uh, but it usually takes only a couple of seconds max. So uh, to us, it appears to be good enough for our applications. So now this is the last part of my presentation. I'm going to give some uh, concrete examples of applications uh, that we implemented by, based on this prototyping platform uh, and technologies. So there will be some videos. Uh, so I suspect they will not play properly. They will mention one image from time to time, but it's not a big deal. Uh, anyway, do not hesitate to contact me uh, if you want more information about, um, about anything. OK, so one of the applications of this kind of workflow is the development of uh, multi-player games. So Christmas hunting game uh, is one of the first prototypes we developed uh, using that kind of platform. So there are two or more players in a room and they use the mobile device, which is a phone or a tablet, to search for virtual toys, to catch them, to send them to a, to a basket and mark points. So what's interesting here is that the virtual objects, both the toys and the elf, they blend in in the room environment, they interact with it, and very importantly, they share between the multiple users uh, who can see the same objects at the same place uh, and with the same animation. So this is really a, a classical example of a of shared application. So now, uh, diminished reality is another example of application uh, which is more challenging. Uh, so today, most AI application consists in certain virtual elements into a real space, into a real scene. So here it's different uh, because you want to remove the real object from the real scene and to render in real time the end scene area. So in this application, we assume we're able to capture the scene with the object at some point in the past. And in fact, the background texture is available on the server uh, thanks to a texture mapping solution. So the application, what does it do? It extracts the background texture from the scene model on the hair hub. And then we have a real-time uh, photogrammetric alignment, which is run on the mobile device uh, using a GPU-based color correction process to make up with the color differences between uh, the keyframe reference images from the server and the images uh, seen by the mobile device during the experience. So this technology actually can be very useful, uh, for instance, to help users respect privacy in conference, teleconference, or uh, remote visits, for instance. And at large, uh, it should also enable users to, to personalize their own uh, real environment, uh, for instance, to create their own internet design, removing objects before uh, trying new ones, or having a personalized gaming environment, for instance. So this demonstration was actually presented at Lab at Virtual last year. Uh, and in the image, you can see the, the output. So you've got uh, a real car that was replaced by a virtual one. Here you can see a tripod, a real tripod that was removed and replaced by a seat. And as you can see, there is an um, occlusion that I manage. So the, real, the virtual seat is hidden by the real table here. Uh, and finally, it can also be used to, to remove people in exactly in the same way as objects. So we've just seen we can alter the appearance of the reward by removing a real object from it. Uh, we can also change the appearance of the reward by adding new light sources to the real scenes. And this is precisely what this application does. Uh, so it can, for instance, be used to visualize the impact of the lamp in your town, in your, in your home, uh, or to personalize the ambience of your room. Uh, we could be useful for decoration or gaming, for instance. So in this application, the user can add new virtual light sources, like can point lights, or spotlights. Uh, you can also choose intensity and color. And the lighting effects are computed uh, using the, the light image uh, provided by the camera, but also the 3D information provided by the server. So you, you do not need to have a depth sensor or to have a depth uh, estimation on your mobile uh, camera running live. The scene is rendered in real time on your mobile device and with appropriate cast shadows and reflection thanks to the, to the 3D model, the reference 3D model. And you can also add virtual objects to the scene and interact with them. So like I said, you can see some example of what, uh, what it looks like, how you can just uh, you know, personalize the lighting in your, your environment. Uh, finally, I will conclude with uh, an example of an application that is different, focusing on remote interactions. 
uh, with the reverse rather than visual enhancements. So this is a score airbot. Uh, and more precisely, this is a base interface uh, that went on the phone uh, to move a robot uh, towards a target point, uh, assuming that the robot is equipped uh, with the leader. So in fact, uh, the application enables the automatic localization of both the phone using uh, the, the camera, using image, and also the robot using the 3D data captured by the leader. Uh, so everything, the robot location, navigation, uh, and phone location as well, they're um, completed in the hair hub. Uh, and on request, so you select a point uh, through your screen, and the robot will automatically move to the, to the selected location. So one direct application of this is uh, it can be applied to a uh, robot vacuum cleaner, for instance, so the premium vacuum cleaner that I could put later. Okay, so I'm now arriving to the conclusion of my presentation. Uh, so we've We've been experimenting various mixed reality workflows in the home, uh, where the data are managed, or the data by the real environment, they're managed by a single server. Uh, we also developed technologies to support this workflow. So you've seen that our solution, uh, they enable next generation mixed reality experiences. Uh, and there are also quite uh, limited issues uh, regarding privacy, connectivity, infrastructure and scalability, because it's easier to deal with this when you've got a local uh, platform rather than a um, standard uh, air cloud solution. Uh, of course, there are still many challenges to solve. Uh, there is uh, model completion in case of partial data, and data are always partial. Uh, there is change detection and model update. Of course, things evolve, and uh, how do you how do you update your reference model on the server? Um, it also needs to improve the robustness of the modeling solution, like especially geometry, tracking, they're so important for the realism of the application that uh, it is very important to continue working on these, uh, on these topics. Uh, semantics analysis is also key to have uh, seamless experiences and contextual experiences. Uh, and finally, uh, data interoperability uh, is still a major issue, uh, and it's something which is very uh, relevant and to be, be really uh, worked on. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions? Thank you, Karine. Uh, if you have any question, you can write right on the on the chat. Uh, we, we yes we have question uh, just to begin talk about a major issue uh, is the data interoperability uh, it's as data uh, is a key a key point to imagine digital twins do you think the situation will be better when in one year in ten year in hundred year regarding interoperability. Yeah, I, th I think it's a very, no, uh, I think it's a very um, uh, complex and massive uh, problems because uh, you can see now there are uh, many, there are many different devices, many different initiatives. Um, also, the big ones have got their own format and they want, they've got their own uh, workflow. So this is really a, a major issue, and I. Unfortunately, I do not believe it will be solved within one year. It's going to take uh, several years. Uh, and it's very important to be able to build an ecosystem, so to have several people to join together, to, to be able to propose some inter-operable uh, solutions. Thanks. Uh, could you see the question in the chat? Yes. Uh... Question of Efe Agutin about uh, relighting the room. No, I cannot see this question. Why is it? Uh, on the public chat, just uh, close to the micro icon. Does the system work with low light conditions? Exactly. Yes, no. Um, 
We, I mean, we've got several solutions. I mean, the most promising uh, approach is uh, based on uh, cash shadows. And uh, of course, for it to work properly, you need to be able to extract to detect the shadows. So in low lighting conditions, uh, you, you wouldn't be able to extract shadows and then it would be more complicated. So, but again, I believe that there isn't just one single uh, solution. There should be uh, different methods appropriate to different contexts. Uh, I suspect that in low lighting conditions, uh, you you need well specific solution already under lighting. That's that's something which is quite easy to estimate, and so you can reproduce low lighting conditions. But now, if you want to be more subtle about it, if you want to get into more details, uh, then it's true. This is a, a particularly uh, difficult situation to analyze. Thank you. Another question is about uh, industrial use cases. What for you is the the best industrial use cases you work on? Um, <laughs> I difficult. Don't know. Yes, I mean I wouldn't be able to say I mean I don't I don't believe there is a best uh, a best use case. Uh, so we all you know we're always waiting for the uh, which is called the killer app, but I do not believe there is a killer app or there is a best use case. Uh, there are many very interesting use cases. Uh, all of them are very different. So in our work, we, we focus on, on things that are not, um, uh, I would say, that are um, like object removal. For, for instance, diminish reality. I really believe in diminish reality because until now, you do not see a lot of solution uh, using this. And yet, I believe it would open a lot of doors and you would uh, uh, enable a lot of new applications if you would be able to remove an object, but not just remove, but for instance, uh, changing the color of an object or even relighting. I mean, to me, a very important uh, use case is not just adding new stuff within the real world, but is it changing, changing the real elements of the world. And to me, that's very important. Uh, it's very challenging, but it would, it would enable a lot of, uh, of new applications in many domains. Okay, the, the next question should should be on the, the robot case, the AI robot case. Uh, what is the process for capturing the physical environment to begin with? Is it the robot? Um, so the, the reference 3D model, which is stored on the server, uh, is uh, we've got several possibilities. We can use, use a depth sensor or a photogrammetry using images. So this is, Currently, we've got these two, these two solutions, but it could be another one. What's important is that at the end, we need to have on the server, we need to have a 3D mesh, and we need to have some uh, key frames, some key images associated to this 3D mesh. Whatever uh, the 3D, I mean, the, the data, the model can be obtained in different ways. So once you've got this um, model, which is consists of both 3D and images, then you are able to align and to register different devices to it. If uh, the device is a phone, then you use the keyframe uh, and the images from the phone to, uh, to align the device. If the, now the requesting device is a robot, as it is the case in the airport application, the robot doesn't have any camera, it doesn't provide any image, it only provides a 3D map which is captured at the floor level. But then you use a 3D mesh and uh, we've got, um, got our solution to match uh, the 3D mesh with this uh, floor level uh, 3D related data to register the robot. And thanks to that, uh, via the central reference model, uh, we can always have a link between the robot and the phone. Also, they provide very heterogeneous uh, data. And they, I mean, at first, uh, it seems to have no solution to register, to know the position of one with respect to the other one. But this is possible because our reference model is composed of both 3D and images. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, I propose to keep the, the last question about the technology readiness level uh, for consumer hammer uh, to, the, to the last panel because it is quite, uh, quite a general question. So thank you, Caroline, again. Welcome. And uh, please, uh, Johan, you are here. To you, Jan.
Okay, so today um, I will present, as I said before, uh, how uh, we use uh, new realities to improve uh, processes through the uh, digital twin. So, as I said before, I'm in Vaughan. As you can see, I came with my twin also, virtual one that I have here. But uh, as you can see, we. Best slide ever. <laughs> this is a, a way to understand that digital twins is not only a, re um, a representation of something existing, it's uh, also a way to focus the data wherever you want. So, in the same virtual, oh, the same virtual uh, twin, I can represent two aspects of my own personality. Oh, maybe um, an error. One more time. It's okay. Okay, so first of all, I don't know if you are all um, uh, aware of what is the digital twin. I hope uh, that this is the case. Basically, digital twin is a representation of something real, synchronized in the digital world. So when we are talking about digital twins, we can understand behind that several uh, different uh, level before, uh, first of all, uh, the things, everything that we have around us. I mean, you maybe have a washing machine connected to a map on your iPhone that is able to send you the state of, uh, of his, uh, his um, working system or whatever. If you have a Tesla, it's not my guess, but you can also have a lot of information about it. So you you are able to synchronize the virtual representation of something existing. It's not only um, uh, things that we can imagine in a digital thing. We also try to link environment, for a whole city in terms of smart city, for example, buildings, systems that make several things work together. And uh, we try to bring all that data on the virtual representation in order to uh, have more information, make simulations, so on. And there is a third level of twin that we used to work with, is the people. I don't know if you play uh, FIFA, for example, a PlayStation, but what you have in FIFA, it's a virtual uh, representation of players. And you may have your own <laughs> representation uh, in the game. Uh, today, we, we work a lot on that. I think in terms of digital twin, it's really interesting to see how few by few we are able to have a precise view of people in the digital world. In that case, in that picture, is this is something that we are doing uh, currently in uh, in, uh, in Austria with a uh, part of South Australia. It's all okay. So, uh, uh, the data reality uh, uh, investigation center. And what we're doing, it's a at the end, it's a twin of the patient to the uh, medical staff, so they can share together the problem the, the, of, of the patient. They can collaborate. So they can have a, can have a real uh, X-ray view on what whatever the patient has. It's really important to see how uh, there is several levels uh, on digital twin. But today, what we are uh, looking at is digital twin industry. And when we are thinking about digital industry, the same levels. I mean, uh, the things are the product, people are the workers, and my environment is in, in my shop floor. So today, having a correct and detailed view on what is occurring on, on all the processes and all the life cycle in my product is something that I already have. I mean, I have resource and planification system, and I have product life cycle management system, CAD, uh, manufacturing and engineering management system. And in addition, I have a new wave of IoT devices uh, that brings me in real time all the information what is happening on the shop floor. Um, if I, I add to all of this uh, some AI stuff to predict what will occur. I have already everything that I need in terms of digital twin. I mean, a 
precise, detailed, real-time view of what is happening on all the life cycle of my product in my factory. So the big question is, why do we need mixed reality? What value can we bring mixed reality in that context? So thinking about that, as said, um, we will we'll go through three different uh, axes of, uh, of reflection on that. The, the first one is that uh, mixed reality will bring us uh, a different way to understand the data <clears throat> uh, of the product, especially uh, when we have a huge amount of real, real time or simulated data on, uh, on the product that we are uh, looking at. In that case, uh, to have an idea on how mixed reality uh, can bring more value to the twin, uh, we, we have those two examples. The first one, something that we've done by Makeable, uh, an engineer testing, a test engineer in the, in the army, to have a, a dedicated view of the crush uh, radar section or surface equivalent radar on the on the on the aircraft. It's something really hard to do with uh, traditional way of seeing data. It's really complex data, depending of the azimuth of the radar. They don't have the same values. So in that case, uh, we are able to correlate immediately the geometry of the aircraft, uh, the configuration and the, of the aircraft with the real-time data, if we have the system connected or the simulated data, making all that huge amount that are really uh, easy to understand. The second case is really similar. How we can understand easily the ultrasonic value of uh, a kind of echograph for non-destructive tests in the industry. So what we've made in that case is to integrate the sensor they have uh, to the HoloLens. In that way, we can directly see while we are uh, doing the test, the destructive test with the echograph, you can directly see the response of the sensor on top of the part we are inspecting. Today, uh, it's not uh, novel technology overkill because uh, there is a lot of stress on that uh, testing part in the industry which uh, new material component of flying uh, uh, part of an aircraft has to be tested uh, with this kind of equipment so um, being able to deliver uh, fast is being able to have a good quality uh, level and uh, really efficient uh, test engineer. So the first, the first axis to understand how mixed reality uh, give more value of the digital twin it's, it's uh, how we can uh, convert the data to have something really more sensitive for people who are using it on, on the industry. On one, I think it's the reason uh, when you are uh, in a production mode, you can't easily uh, have access to uh, the environment. And uh, one uh, key point of, uh, of the performance of your industry would be the relation between your worker and his workstation. With that mixed reality, it's really difficult only on a nodded uh, uh, trail with some dashboard and some uh, reports to have a good overview on how behave uh, the blue collar on this uh, workstation. In addition, you are not able to stop part of the industry or, or make some uh, physical representation of uh, some, uh, some parts of the, of the shop floor in order to make it more efficient. So what we've done in that case uh, is uh, it's uh, using virtual reality to use the exact representation of the kitting zone. The kitting process is the people that are preparing some uh, package with all the parts that one operator would need for a dedicated operation, for a dedicated model of car on the assembly line. So it's really critical because all those packages need to be perfect and have to, be, uh, have to follow the production model. So with this uh, with this development, we are able to tune 
the kit in zone in order to make it more uh, efficient uh, with the with the work. We are also able to prepare the configuration of the kit in zone for the future uh, manufacturing process. So this is something that we can't do with the traditional um, digital twin, but with the apportation of VR in this environment, we are able to speed up the rhythm of the production uh, with uh, optimization of the workstation and with anticipation of the next, uh, the next um, uh, manufacturing program. And the third point, it's the perception. Uh, today, we are working with, uh, with the FIAC by the fact uh, Mark is with us from PTC and a specific uh, agreement uh, with PTC, the FIAC, this is a distinguishing center in Spain. I live in Spain, I don't know if there are uh, Spanish people there. Uh, this is an investigation center uh, dedicated to new material. And what we are doing with them is uh, how we can create a full digital continuum between all the departments. Um, today, uh, the, the exchanging of information we have between engineering and the shop floor or, or the testing and quality parts uh, can add some uh, friction and some uh, latency in the, in the, in the overall um, uh, process. So what we are doing is fixing everything on the digital market and make uh, a continuous automatic uh, chain from the design uh, tools, in that case Katia, it's uh, a, CAD, uh, a CAD for people who don't know Katia. So it's a CAD system to design uh, the parts. And the uh, engineers on that system were able to create their own scenario, presenting different view without having other kind of tools. You can directly on Katia create those scenarios, then export that scenario as an instruction book or quality book. So the people on the show floor uh, can uh, immediately uh, download that book and, and, and see and follow the, the, the instruction. Uh, what is really interesting in that is that uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a team, we have several departments. Everybody has a different perception of the product. Uh, I mean, if you are a designer, you are really focused on the uh, dynamical uh, topics of the product. You may have a way to understand and to talk about the product that is specific to your, uh, to your work. Uh, it's not uh, the same that the people that will uh, check uh, the quality or put some brackets on it, something like that. So what it's interesting is to see how the digital mockup, and digital twin in that case of that precise part of the aircraft uh, is, a, is an universal way to exchange information behind uh, between all those uh, uh, silos. Uh, the other really interesting thing we have, uh, we have implemented is that uh, the, the, the exchanging the exchanges between uh, each side are um, faster. I mean, we can easily during the process uh, create uh, instruction for uh, the assembly of this part. You upload it to our system so the people that will uh, make it can download it immediately. If there is some uh, quality issue, we can close the loop quickly and say, well, uh, maybe in that step I can hide something. Uh, and it's something um, really, really, really constant. Uh, I mean, the flow information that we are, that we are in all of the, the life cycle of the, of the project. And uh, if we push that uh, all together, I mean, the the, the kind of data that we use, uh, the way we are able to accelerate the rhythm and, uh, and the perception of all the different actors uh, on the 
on the process, we are able uh, to go further and uh, to make this uh, with it. So once we have the full uh, digital XR uh, um, uh, twin, we are able to share all this kind of uh, information in real time uh, all over the world. So uh, especially uh, in a period like the one we are living today uh, at home, where we want to go on uh, working. Uh, it's it's a really important uh, way to focus people on their core uh, um, business uh, without uh, the, the the need to travel to uh, understand uh, different uh, other kind of uh, perception. I mean everything based on the, the digital market. So this is uh, basically the three example uh, we wanted to to share with you today. I think that uh, yes, uh, at the end uh, there is a, a specific value and using reality or extended reality. I mean AR, VR in the the process and uh, in association to the digital twin for those three for three um, reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, in, in make the data much more uh, understandable for the people. It's it's the unique uh, way to accelerate the phases between all the departments to have a, a better rhythm of all the life cycle of your product. And then the perception of this uh, product and the way we are able to represent the environment the people and uh, and the product in unique uh, human uh, way of understanding the, the digital market make uh, the collaboration easier in the industry and in other sectors also and uh, and facilitate the decision making. And that's all for me. Thank you, Johan. I applaud. <laughs> Many thanks for your presentation. Uh, as usual, if you have a question, you can write on the on the chat. But I, I have a, a very simple question. If you remember last year in La Vaisier 12, I, I think we talked about digital twin. Uh, in one year for you, what what you see as uh, evolution of the use in the use of digital twin in industry. Well, I, I think that there is a combination of several things, uh, a push uh, by the the IT technology on uh, IoT and uh, AI makes uh, digital twin digital twin explode today. I mean, we are able. Uh, to go further than the typical SCADA system, etc., to collect all the information, not only of uh, machine, but on the whole environment, even what we said before on the work behavior that on the factory. We used to integrate, uh, for example, Singwell from PTC, this kind of, of tools that uh, our partner are giving to the, the industry. Uh, uh, um, a link uh, to uh, have a correct representation of what is occurring, a real time vision in digital world. What is occurring. I think in one year, there is several things that our partner um, uh, pushed to the market uh, evolution on the IoT parts, evolution on the AI parts, uh, and evolution on the devices we can use. We are all we are expecting the whole lens too, for example, and today we are seeing this is. Nice, more uh, possible to deploy on on the factory. That's so the interest is there, and I think that uh, unfortunately uh, for the uh, period that we are living, I think that representation of the virtual uh, world will help the industry, and this may be uh, a good thing. I mean, uh, to understand better how we can work in the digital world. This is what we are doing today uh, in this virtual event. So I think the digital twin 
it's it's something that's going uh, really fast today. Okay. Uh, just a last question from the chat. Um, will you be able to simulate the entire the entire design process, or you started with a single component and uh, what technical difficulties you had? Today, today it's true that uh, we uh, we we focus on on specific parts of the process. What we try to do is to make uh, all the people collaborate on the same point of view. That is the digital market. So today we don't have the full uh, simulation of the process. There is traditional uh, tools that will be able to do that, so even um, and so on. Uh, you know, yeah, we can simulate the, the, the whole fabrication process, but in terms of XR, we are focusing on dedicated uh, parts and on the collaboration uh, on the digital market, making all the people push their information, the valuable information, on the same 3D uh, reference model, I would say. Okay. Uh, Irene, I see your question, but uh, I propose to keep it for the panel because uh, it's a very broad question. It's very interesting about the nature of the digital twin, in fact. So thank you again, Ivo. Uh, thank you again, Johan, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, please. Thank you. And we're pleased to welcome now Kevin on stage. Kevin, could you? you... OK, can you stage is yours. You can begin. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here again, uh, as I was with Laval last year in a physical experience. It's quite difficult for me to do a conference that way because I'm not really used to it. Like, I used to see a lot of people uh, and the reaction of people when presenting, but uh, we will keep it uh, digital for that time. And uh, uh, first of all, I, I, I would like to say that what Laval did this year is amazing and uh, in the short period of time, it, it's great. Uh, I will try to bring you value with the presentation today in showing you a real example in industry and how they can use the VR. And um, first of all, let me introduce the company so you know what we do and how we, we get this example uh, done. So Group AP360 is making VR since 2012. And in order to grow faster, we open up a franchise. And in the last five, six years, we open up 40 franchises all over France, Switzerland, and Caribbean as well, which means that we produce a lot of VR. And all the data I'm bringing today are the data we collect ourselves and not the data that we, we take on Google or whatever. So we will really try to bring you value today by giving you the, the the good the good way of producing a VR and and how it would uh, as a good example. So I used to be working for Google as a marketing director in Sydney, and that's why I'm really into data and uh, you know all of that analytics. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I uh, hear someone okay. talking. Okay. It's okay. Okay. So just just a bit of context today. Uh, there is. There are more than 4.5 billion people online now, and COVID actually increased that number. And, and the fact that people are going online, they're trying to find new ways of promoting uh, marketing and, and doing learning as well. So we reached a new life, which is e-life, and Laval is a great example of it. For example, the Congress now becomes e-Congress, and business become e-business, visit e-visit, and, and um, school school and you know, and so on. So I want to give you the different usage uh, uses of VR. And today we'll focus on one more than another. The first use of it is learning, learning or digital learning, depending on how you call it. But uh, I don't want to focus on it. We, we did it last year and you've got many conferences about this subject. I will be focusing on, on the use of VR for marketing purposes and uh, commercial purposes. So it's split into two different parts, whether you, you will lose it for internal marketing or external marketing, or even both of them. And today we'll be focusing on the Schneider electric uh, device in VR that we produce for them, which was used for both usage, internal and external. 
So electric, they wanted to digitalize their company in Chaos, in Nice. We actually did many other sites for them, but today we'll focus on the one from Nice. And what's important is why did they want to uh, virtualize their, their company and, and the production sites? First of all, they wanted to emphasize the production site and uh, show the R&D production and all of that aspect. It's kind of a internal use because they will use it also for new customers. When people come to the company, they want to know what production site is doing what and who is working where. So an internal tool for them, kind of like a map. So you know exactly in Nice who is working on what and what they are doing and do they have a specific you know, R&D process and all of that stuff. So it's a new way of presenting internal and external purposes, as I said. They make the site accessible 24 seven as well, because we know that they have people working from all over the world uh, with the site, whether for commercial purposes or internal purposes as well. I want to show the energy efficiency as well. I will show you the example uh, on my screen. We'll exactly see how it works. They want to be different and innovate as well and help people to protect themselves. Again, by the way, for external purposes, if you want to sell your product that you're producing when you, with your company in the industrial environment, or if you want to explain a process on how you produce something, or even if you want to bring your employees with you and explain to them tomorrow your new job will be this and, that, and that's how you will do it. So it's, it's better and easier for them to, to project themselves to on how they, they, they will do it. Again, we really uh, ask a lot of questions to our clients because we wanted to know how they would like to use it, whether it would be on mobile, tablet, computer, or VR. And I really want to emphasize on that point because VR is, is, a, is a point. It's really important. Um, most of companies right now, we, we do, um, we do work with a lot of uh, uh, big companies from uh, CAC 40, and uh, uh, most of companies want to go to VR because it's it's uh, it's fancy, it's nice, and all of that. But that shouldn't be the reason why you go to VR. VR is not only a technology, really, you know, savvy technology that you would use because it it's it's something and and it's nice to to say you are doing it. You really have to have a purpose on that. And it makes me think of one uh, client that we uh, we have, which is uh, FH Construction, and they actually used to do VR before they, they knew us. And VR was not the right user because they gave it to people uh, working in buildings, and they were not used to VR, and they didn't want to wear the mask and you know, the, the VR stuff. So it was complicated for them. So the first of all, when, when you create um, VR or 3 experience, you really have to determine and, and exactly who you are targeting, who will be using, and what would be friction points. For example, is uh, the people who would be using it be tech savvy or not? If not, try to make it really simple, and it's really important. I will show you the example right after this slide, but what makes a great experience right now? you want to have some content and i explain a lot of that because you have two kind of content pull content and push content the push content for example like a video you are just pushing the content to your user whether they are employees or whether it's for marketing commercial purposes and they kind of like uh they, they get the impression but they they don't select what they want to to learn from it or you've got pull content which means you give content to your user and they will get themselves the experience. They will get them the information and they will do their proper experience, own experience. So, which means VR for, VR for visiting a place, it's obsolete right now. When you're visiting a place, you want to get information which leads you to another place, to another place and to another place. And then you get more information. And then finally you turn to a customer. So, first of all, what makes a great experience is you will have to be able to renew information 
which means if you have information in your VR experience, you have to be able to change it yourself. Which means you renew information frequently, you make people come back. And you don't pay for something that has to change every two months or every month, which means you have to uh, get to the company you're working with and all of that stuff. So try to think about it from a long-term perspective. Second of all, try and statistics. When you do a VR experience, you have to think about the ROI and your KPIs. That's what makes a great experience because we have seen so much bug proof of concept that people are deploying. They are not paying for it. And, and then they go like, oh, yeah, VR, it, it was great, but we don't want to go more into VR because we really know what we, 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 we got from it. So if the client pays for it, has KPIs and, and, and are able to check the ROI, then the experience would be better because they know this is working, this is not, and that's how we will improve over the time. And that's the second one, and for me, the most important one. Third one that I actually already talked a bit about, the persona. You have to know who you are targeting, who is going to be using it, and what are the friction points. Because to target the, the wrong people... Sorry, I can hear myself. <laughs> If you target the, the, the wrong people, then you can deploy the best VR experience, but for the wrong people, then your experience is less. So please make sure that you know exactly who you're targeting and what they, they are expecting from the, from the, the VR experience. Few points. It has to be quick to load. Like Laval, it's quite quick to, to load, which means people can actually use it uh, effectively. The less click you have to convert makes more benefits because if you have to click 10 times to get access to the conversion point, then the, the our experience won't be uh, good on our ROI. That to be easy to use, easy to deploy because obviously when you are working in an industrial perspective, then you want to uh, deploy it after and to more uh, sites. So it has to be easy to deploy and you have to think about it when you first deploy the first one. So obviously you have to make it scalable. Think like a customer first. It's something that seems simple, but most of the time when you're deploying VR, you, you are really thinking about the technology before thinking about the usage. And the usage should be first and, and the technology should come second because most of the time, the customer don't care about the technology. What they want is something easy to use, as I said, and, and which brings them value. So think about the customer first and think about an experience that brings value to the customer. And the last concept, which I love, is keep it super simple uh, or keep it straight and forward. Because, again, if you've got a really simple um, way of using the VR, then more people will, will use it will use it and, and then um, you will have more conversion and you will make more money uh, or train more people. So let me just change my screen right now so I can show you the example with Schneider Electric. For those who would like presentation um, with some more notes, uh, we, we prepared a second one with more notes. Uh, if you want it, then uh, we will be glad to send it to you if you just uh, send me a private message. Uh, it's, it's obviously free for everyone. Let me just give you the link for Schneider Electric. Gregory, please, can you tell me if you can see it now? Yeah, it's okay for us. Okay, great. So, basically, Schneider Electric, as I said, we get back to the point I mentioned before. So, as you can see, whether you can move from a place to another or you can get information. Here, you get information about the client explaining uh, how was the, the building and all of that stuff. So there is quite a, a time difference between the time I click on a point and the time it shows with a crank wheel that we use to show the screen. Um, so here are the informations. As I said, the client has the ability to change, modify it as much as he wants and whenever he wants the content. Because obviously, if you deploy this kind of a VR um, project, you want to be able to change it and it hasn't to be updated in the next two weeks or two months. 
then if you click on arrows, then obviously you move from a place to another. As I said, it has to be quick to load. It has to show different content. It has to be easy to navigate as well. So that's a way of navigating through a menu. And let's say I am working for Schneider and I'm uh, working as a sales, then I can show through Zoom or any presentation online um, what we produce, how we produce it, and, and you know, do like a virtual tour of the, the technology. So that's a way of using uh, for marketing, internal and external. And they actually use it for recruiting people as well, because obviously when you see that, you say, okay, uh, they have this kind of, uh, you know, technology here. Uh, I would like to work for them. That would be nice. And I really use it to emphasize the, the way they onboard people as well. So sum up what I just said, it has to be simple. It has to have information, which makes um, the, 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 the experience better. You have to know who you're targeting and who is using it. And who you are targeting is the device as well. Here is just an online version, but they also have the version of the virtual gear, but they don't use it for the same people at the same time. With the virtual gear, they use it for people internally or people who would like to come to sites. And because they can't always bring them in the site to the right place, then they can give them the, the gear, and so they project them to this place. Um, and finally, you have to know exactly why you are doing it and how much it brings value to the customer and how much value it brings to you as a, as a client. Because you want to know if this gives you the ability to sell more, to recruit more, to recruit better, and for the final user, is this operation giving me more information and helping me to you know, uh, get a de decision and, and bring me value. So I could talk about that for ages and hours. Uh, so I would more like to interact with you guys. And if you have any questions and statistics about this kind of uh, usage, because I have some more right here. Maybe you can see my screen now. I'll just show you again my presentation because I've got some data for you. Okay, so I guess it's all right. For example, for this setup of solution, um, it's a link, as I said, whether it's a link, so you can, you can send it through emails and, you know, uh, have a website, uh, or it's a VR experience as well when they use it internally or when they go abroad to, to explain how they work. It has to be responsive, of course, because you want to use it on your mobile tablet and many devices. It has to go for social media, email signature, extranet, newsletter, and all of that stuff. Again, when you produce this type of content, you want your client to use it to the most devices, uh, the, the more devices, and, and, and the more uh, places as well, as I said, social media, signature, extranet, newsletter, and all of that. They actually use it a um, special way because they use it as a website. And now we talk more and more about augmented website, which is you're just going to uh, the address right here and you go straight away to the virtual tool, which the virtual tool is made like a website, but you can actually move the place to another, which brings great statistics, as you can see here. Um, we, we, we brought to you the, the last two months data is because we, we don't want to show so much data about our client. Uh, um, what's important here is the time that they spent, they spent on average, because you know that a normal website, people would mainly spend 30 seconds less. Here, they spend more. Again, as I said, it's push up content. Pull content, you let themselves create their own experience, and that's what's important. And the bounce rate as well. Bounce rate is important because it means how many people um, to your website or your experience, their experience, and left the experience without looking anywhere. So here, uh, we are less than 5%, which if I give you the average of the website right now during uh, COVID-19 is more like 70, 75%, which means almost eight people out of 10 
who go to your website will live with clicking anywhere rather than on the virtual virtual tour it's less than five people again it's a pool contents and that's why they create their own experience they on the high points they get information and then they go to another get more information they can spend the time they want wherever they want so it's a mix up of all what we said before we uh, knew who we were targeting we knew how they would use this and that's why we have such good statistics on, on these uh, clients as i said for those who want i can give you a presentation uh, obviously give me a private message uh, will be free so to talk uh, i will be in laval for the whole day so if anyone wants to talk about it uh, as you can hear i'm quite passionate about uh, this job and, and we do so i will be uh, happy to talk with you about vr and industries and how to use vr thanks everyone and free to ask questions now Thanks, Kevin. If you have questions, you can uh, write it or or ask it. You unmute your microphone, ask the question, or raise hand as you want. you want any statistics about another uh, kind of client that have like this one or anything that makes a great our experience or you know you have a question on the chat even from uh Yaren. how can you get a user how can you get a user to return this kind of experience <laughs> once they have played the visit sorry gregory Wait, Some, you, someone so took at the same time just hello, Mr. Ravier. Uh, hello. <laughs> Everyone is talking at the same time. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, I, I, I can see a question which is interesting. How is the uh, cyber security handled? Uh, yeah. Depending on the user, whether they use it for internal purposes, um, we can actually set up passwords and, you know, only people who knows the link have access to it and then they log on or external purposes. So you don't really uh, get on cyber security because you have nothing to lose because you want everyone to know about it. It's, it has to go viral, right? Um, it really depends on how they want to use it. But again, um, depending on what they want and how they will use it, we, we, we can uh, protect it more or less. Uh, it's, it's all cut from uh, so basically we, we do whatever we want. Uh, maybe another one. Yeah, the last one is a uh, really pretty severe. Fortunate uh, exist. Yeah, the, the one from Nadia. Yeah. Okay. Is this a uh, three TVR? Yes, it is. It actually, um, again, when we put it simple, um, VR is what it's virtual tool 360 put in the VR gear, right? So whether it's virtual tool or VR. It's same. It's just a way of displaying it, which is different. So how were they a bit for Schneider, as they have very complex infrastructure? Um, I I don't get what you where you want to go with this question. Nadia, can you please please be more precise about the question? No, I think it's about the the nature of the experience. Oh, it, it's as I it's, it's for marketing purposes because they wanted okay. to explain uh, how good they are and great they are for uh, the, their technology, how the site is for recruiting purposes, how commercial how salespeople use it as a presentation tool as well, and uh, internal purposes because they want every employee from Schneider to know. The, the the wide range of how Schneider works and if you're working in Paris and you want to know what's happening in Nice, right? So that's um, uh, like a big picture of how they use it. But again, 
if you want to, to talk about it in more details, uh, I will be uh, uh, happy to talk with you about that. Thank you again, Kevin. We keep the other questions for the panel just after yep. Mark uh, talk. Thank you again. Thank you. You can take a seat on stage. Mark? Yep, I'm here. Uh, do you hear me, Grigori? Is it okay? Perfect. We can see you. Okay. Screen. So um, I was on, on stage uh, like, what, uh, one hour and a half. Uh, and I think it's, I just want to make some rhythm here uh, to wake up um, because we had a lot of great uh, speeches um, from Sopra, from uh, Julien and so on. Um, and at PTC, we have a unique chance. Uh, we are one of the companies that are uh, the most um, ready uh, to talk about uh, digital twin. Why? Because PTC, as some of you know, um, is coming from the 3D design with a tool uh, called Creo. And then they move to, we move to um, product life management with Windshield. And then our CEO thought, yeah, we design, we manage uh, the design, and what after? We went for IoT uh, with Syncworks. And now uh, we also have Euphoria um, to be able to view all the digital continuity of the 3D models. So um, <clears throat> I just wanted today to share with you concrete examples. Uh, concrete examples that how augmented reality can use a digital twin. And at PTC, that's the, in our DNA. It's in the DNA of, of Euphoria, our augmented reality product line. And to be honest, we are doing it on, on a daily basis. Um, when I'm, I, I'm, I'm resuming, uh, what is my job? Uh, most of the time at PTC, we are doing the link with physical and digital. And the chance is to be already in the 3D environment with design. So people trust on us and we have access to the start of the 3D life cycle. So we are already at the beginning of everything, which allows us to move uh, to a lot of space in a company. Um, we are in the manufacturing environment and also in the supply chains, in the supply chain, but we are also in customer operation. We are in customer services. Uh, we are in the engineering part. And in all those sectors, we are able to talk about digital twin. Remember my introduction of the conference. Digital twin is Sorry, everywhere. Mark. Yeah. I'm able to go in full screen for your presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me, let me you try to make zoom now. Yeah, there are many, many things on your slide and it's difficult to see for people. Yeah, but it's not so important. As you want, if there is a problem with the full screen as you saw uh, yesterday, be, be careful. Yeah, no, if people want to, it's uh, mainly here we are talking about where uh, we are playing with a PTC uh, full uh, product line. Um, it's just to, to, to say that digital twin is everywhere. And like I said during the introduction, the data is key. And our chance is to have access to the data. So we are able to work on, on, on really nice projects. And that uh, is the aim of today. Um, so I, I firstly wanted to, to share you uh, something uh, pretty simple that I added to my presentation. Um, it's just what we call the model target uh, within the Euphoria engine. Uh, most of you knows, uh, you, you know, everybody know uh, Euphoria engine. It's uh, the computer vision used in in um, in Pokemon Go, in Vivino, in a lot of application, like 60% uh, of the market. Uh, and the chance of having access to the 3D uh, models for us is to be able to do that, to, to have a 3D model 360 uh, able to recognize in, 
in in a f less than a second what is the object in front of us um, to be able to distinguish a Lamborghini uh, a, a, and a Ferrari, for example, and be able to plug the digital twin on it. And why we are able to do that? Because we have access to the 3D uh, DNA of the end customer. And that's key. That's really key. Um, I saw some presentation in Laval where um, we are still based on images. Uh, images was what uh, where what was used like years ago to do uh, augmented reality. Now we move to to 3D models like this, able to uh, recognize any any parts. And working with that, uh, and I think you came for that. Uh, I want to show you uh, what we've done um, with Volvo trucks. Most of you who are used to come to uh, to Laval Virtual, you already know um, the use case of Volvo. Quality check on the production line. Um, Volvo had a simple um, need. They wanted a scalable solution linked to uh, their own IT system. By linked by uh, in their own IT system, I mean able to connect to the ERP and able to identify any model on the production line, any model of motors on the production line. And <clears throat> that's here where the digital twin make it all, where the data quality makes the difference. Um, I will show you, uh, and I hope the video will work uh, without two lags. At Volvo, you identify uh -huh. with a QR. Yeah. Right. Someone was talking. Then yeah, that's... please mute your microphone, please, in the room. Thank you. So on the, mod the motor is identified by a QR code. So what is doing the the, um, the operator? He's scanning uh, the QR code, the QR, uh, the barcode. Sorry, and you've seen like in one second where uh, we go to the system of to the PLM. We get back all the component of the motor and we build live a 3D uh, model target to be able to display the digital twin. And like you see here, it's a digital twin of the motor plugged directly on it. And then afterwards, the operator here, just to show that the model target is pretty robust. Um, and now, we show to the operator where he has to go, what he has to check with digital in a range, and the nearest he is, it's just the physical, and go back, digital. Everything here is, is done automatically. Um, now it's the next step, next step, he has to perform some other uh, check, still in a range. If he need more, needs more information, he has on the right um, a little uh, scheme of uh, what he has to, to check. But also what we've done, we've connected um, like the, um, the gun directly to the application and directly to the system of, of, of Volvo. So automatically the gun knows uh, the, the, the pressure he has to apply to perform the check. So the operator has nothing to do and it's directly linked to the good data in the PLM of the customer. Here's a, uh, one of the last uh, check. And you will see that at the end, he has like um, one part is missing. So he, he will report um, the part, the missing part, and then it will generate an error report, goes directly uh, sent to the ERP, and on the projection line, the motor will be like um, uh, isolated for uh, for check. So um, I think that uh, currently it's one of the most advanced deployed worldwide augmented reality. Uh, connected with digital twin use case. Um, if you are aware of uh, others, um, 
really open to 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 know about it but um it's pretty it's pretty complex but at the end of the day what is making the difference here it's the quality of the data quality of the data in the plm of volvo without the data they won't be able to perform the right uh, quality check without the data we can't build live an augment uh, the 3d the, the model target we can't plug the digital twin if the data is bad so here data is the essence the dna of everything and just to give you an overview of the architecture uh, we are using uh, several uh, blocks of the ptc vuforia uh, of the ptc product line we are using vuforia studio for sure um, to be the augmented reality platform and then we are using syncworks to be a hub for data connection uh, so we are able thanks to our iot platform to uh, connect to acp to erp to plm as well and at the end of the day um, all the data is hosted in the PLM. So when we have to uh, build live the model target of the motor and the digital twin, we are directly uh, going to um, to the PLM to get to get the data. So um, that's how is is built uh, this use case. And we have a lot. We have a lot, honestly. And uh, and that's funny because a lot of of uh, customer. Uh, engage us, and we are working on a lot of quality check, uh, control on the production line, and so on. Using each time the 3D model of the customer, and and having a kind of uh, automatic uh, stuff, and in half of the project, people say, "Yeah, I have I have my return on investment? It's answering to my use case." People are 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 uh, really. A fan of it on, on the production line and willing to adopt because it's it has a real added value for them. But um, at the end of the day, they figured out that the quality of the data in their own system is not at the level expected to perform such augmented, augmented reality experience. So now they go back to project to uh, be able to have a real real uh, high value data in their own system um so mainly that's um uh, that's a volvo uh truck uh use case and i think we're going to have maybe five minutes i have 10 minutes left right yes exactly so um I also added other um, other uh, slides. Um, we we worked with one of our uh, best customer on on a concept, um, and we are showcasing uh, this mainly. It's for Beneto. We are using the 3D uh, model of the boat to be able to recognize it, but also then to um to display uh possible configuration internally and so on to put the boat in a virtual environment um so we are able to do that because of the quality of the data and because of um this digital continuity we are able to put the digital twin of, of, of the boat live it's we are in virtual here but it's plugged on, on, on the real boat. Maybe it's lagging uh, a little bit, or I will deep dive on, on some features like this one with uh, X-ray. Um, Just put the link of the video on the chat. Yeah, uh, I don't have it's It's uh, in my PowerPoint presentation, so. No, no, it's done, Mark. It's okay. 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 And now I want to show you something, something that is coming. Um, well, not coming, that is live. It's also about digital twin. It's what we are talking about today. Digital twin, but digital twin of spaces. I said at the beginning that a digital twin is everywhere, is available for everyone. And here is a concrete example. 
now we are building digital twin of non-digital uh, assets in order to perform what we call area target and to perform um, augmented reality examples. We just launched uh, in Drifoya uh, what we call the area target. We are able to um, display augmented reality um, experiences using area target. I rem remember we, we were talking about model target with 3D, now it's area target. The Schneider use case, for example, it's VR based on photos. Um, imagine uh, we are working with companies, with uh, manufacturers, where you just enter on the, on the parking and the application knows where you are and they are able to display you uh, the pass to go to the main entrance. And then you have a meeting at the second floor, uh, entry B can follow you, you can follow your way. We are using a matter port to scan. We are able to scan 40,000 square meters, 40,000 square meters. And it goes quick. When we started the, uh, the technology, it was 200. Now we are at 40,000 square meters of areas that we can aggregate and where we can display our mental reality example uh, experiences. And then we are still using, you can still use Unity to uh, build your experience uh, inside. And then you are able to display for sure on any device um, your, uh, your experience. And to give you, uh, it's hard to, to display videos, that's why uh, they are not here, but uh, feel free to, con to, to, to contact if you want to know more. But for example, uh, imagine, you know, we've done some, um, some experiences in our own office where you just enter and you are guided to your uh, meeting room. Augmented reality is everywhere and will be even uh, more everywhere uh, in this time. And the technology is coming, is going really quick. Um, like I said, so uh, I'm really impatient. Impatient to see what we will be able to perform next year, what I will be pitching next year, because what I'm pitching today was not what I was pitching last year at Laval. So at the end of the day, Wow, it's awesome. Awesome to be in those time, um, to, to, to live this, uh, not this revolution, but th th this improvement. So um, I think I, I, I'm done. Uh, I'm done with the digital twin. Uh, and feel free to ask uh, any question if you want. Thank you, Mark. I think it could be interesting to begin the panel, if you have, uh, if you have time, uh, and if <laughs> I really need to leave in ten minutes, but uh, okay, yeah. no more we can start the, we you. can start the panel if you want, yeah, and I stay ten minutes. Okay, then I think the first question is for you. So could you <laughs> could you look at the chat, please? Public one. Yeah. yeah, you have four questions for Pascal, Irene, Colin. Okay. It looks like you are using handle device for the AR experiences. What is the expectation for the MR headset becoming mature? Uh, good point, Pascal. Um, device. In my two pitches, did I talk about devices? No, never. I only talk about use cases. Uh, why? Because uh, at PTC, we have the vision to make software that are, av that are available on all platforms. Uh, we worked a lot with Microsoft. Uh, we were the first one in publishing an application for the MWC with, for HoloLens 2, and we are really proud of that. Um, but our technology is working on any devices, and that's uh, the, the, our vision. And yeah, uh, MR devices are being more and more mature, but have a look at them. There are no, none are working on the same platform. Uh, Microsoft is far away from the others deployed in the enterprises. Um, Lenovo devices are based on Android platform. It's it's not so easy. Um, uh, and I think if you uh, and you all know what happened with Magic Leap yesterday, um, it's a big trend. It's a big trend. You can do hardware and software at the same time. 
I think it will be. So, um, and you, you see you have um, a lot of new devices coming. Some will disappear as quick as they can. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, having big players like uh, Lenovo, HP, um, uh, trying to, to compete with, on the market will help to, um, to democratize uh, all the technology for sure. What is the price for an AR project in 2020? Uh, good question. Uh, it depends on what you want to do. Uh, in this session, we talked a lot about digital, uh, digital twin. My advice when I'm in front of customers is to start simple. If you start with a project saying, yeah, I want an AR project connected to all my infrastructure, it won't work because you will have a lot of people involved and at the end of the day, a lot of barriers from IT, from network, from security. And at the end of the day, you will miss the essential, the DNA, the user. Um, so normally, um, it will depend also on the paperwork you, you want to do, but a project you, you can have some with 10K and until 100K, it, it will really depend. Depends also on the technology. Uh, if you are using open source technology, for sure, it will be uh, cheaper. Um, but if you want uh, a computer a computer vision uh, enough robust to have a good quality experience, you will have to pay. So it's really up to you. Um, don't look for something cheaper, so for something cheap. That's my point of view. Look for something that is answering to your need. Don't sacrifice um, the the replay of the experience. Don't sacrifice the computer vision because if your experience is not successful from an operator or a technician point of view, from the end customer himself, he won't adopt. So if you spent 10, 5, uh, 100, if you don't take this in account, you will miss uh, the goal. Maybe if you want the last question for you, is about the standard format. Are you working on standard format or what do you feel about the standard in this field? The question for me, Gregory? Yeah, it's for you, yeah. It's the last and after uh, you, you can go. <laughs> uh, uh, good question. What do you mean by, by, by format? Uh, maybe more about the standard. Uh, as you said, there are many, many hardware platforms, yeah. many ways to, to use it. Um, we are not working on a standout. Um, we are making our technology available for any standard, which is pretty different. Um, uh, on, on the, if I look at the computer vision uh, market, uh, currently Vifoya has like 50 to 60% of market share. Um, still, even with Apple and, uh, and Google competition, and at the end of the day, they are not competitors because we are working with them. We are just uh, offering a kind of uh, solution able to uh, publish any AR experience on any platform. And I really believe that it's, um, it's a good strategy for a, a good and simple reason. Uh, it's up to the end customer to decide what he wants to use. It's not up to us. We can guide, we can advise, but it's up to them to decide, up to their own strategy. If they want to push for innovation, if they have uh, like young people, if they have young, young people or old people, it won't be the same device at the end of the day. So um, being obliged to decide a device in a project, I mean, I have no choice that this one, it's an iPad or I have no choice. It's, uh, I don't know, Vuzix. Uh, for me, it's stupid. Um, well, not stupid, it's not, uh, but it's, it's, um, it's an error. Um, that's my point of view. So um, we are not working for a global standard, but uh, we are working with the, um VRAR association uh, in order to have a kind of 
uh, alignment uh, of all the actors worldwide. Um, really, the idea, the, the market is really moving quick. So um, it's now time to structure the market. Um, and maybe, yeah, uh, it will be like standard coming in, in, in the next uh, years, but not yet. Thank you, Mark. Thank you Thank for you your time. Going. You're welcome. Thanks, everybody. And now, uh, if you have questions for uh, Kevin, Caroline, and Johan, please write it, ask it, raise your hand as you want. Oh, we have a question in the chat, if you can see. Yes. Do you see that any real world data visualization with XR is a digital twin of some sort? Well, maybe I can say something about that. I, 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 I'm not sure that uh, XR is mandatory for for digital twin. Uh, if you imagine my my bank, for example, and my representation, my personal representation for my bank. Uh, doesn't need my physical representation. I mean, with Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and the whole information that my bank has, I think it's 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 enough. But I believe that XR on the digital twin for industry brings uh, more value. Like the fact um, doesn't uh, so need to represent the state of a real object, but it can represent the behavior of that real object in order to simulate uh, new, uh, new, new cases. So it's more uh, wide than the simple representation of physical uh, and uh, real-time uh, data. Caroline? Or Kevin, as you want. Uh, I think you said everything that uh, we, we can't really add anything. Um, but I have another question, and uh, I, if if you maybe answer it first, um, saying what are the future visions and new cases? And um, if you're okay, Gregory, can I jump to that? Okay, no problem. Okay. Um, Basically, what, what we experience now is due to COVID-19, people and companies, if I go wide, companies want to find alternatives to when people meet each other. So the use cases are the ones where uh, the fact that you can visit a place, especially in industry, and you can industry to people and that people to industry uh, is increasing tremendously right now. Because even if these companies respect, you know, the safety procedure and all of that stuff, it costs a lot to make people come and visit the industry. And for example, we work with uh, Safran. It, the, the, you know, when you go there and you want to visit the, 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 the sites, it's take a long, uh, long, long way to, to get teach how to uh, respect the, the procedure and all of that. So now they want to disrupt the industry by making it easier and making people um, not come to the industry, but the industry come to, to them. And um, that's what we, we see right now, a tremendous increase that kind of usage. So maybe the ones would like to add something that's, from my point of view and, and the point of view of our company, that's what we experiment right now. Thank you. It seems that uh, the, the concept of digital twin is not so clear for many of us. We talk about uh, 3D model, we talk about uh, data, technology, but it seems that Everyone have is, has his own idea of what is exactly a digital twin. It's not so difficult to to share to to what to help this concept to grow in industry if uh, every people have it, has his own idea. I think that. 
the right definition is not the the problem of it. is is more about knowing how you can have something online working for you rather than working for online solutions. Because as you said, people have different uh, definition of it. And if we go further in this discussion, people have different definitions about VR, about XT, about AR, and all of that. And yeah. if we go even wider, we do startup. What is a startup like? And and it's not the definition is not the problem. The problem is more about knowing in your strategy that you have to have digital tools that help you to have your business fine as well as business physically here and and both versions to be similar in experience and for me that's what is a between it's a, it's a digital version of the real one giving at least the same or a better usage experience okay in fact yeah it's in terms of experience Uh, just to comment on that, that's uh, it's interesting to have the perception of things or the I real world. to hear you, uh, Johan. Uh, your voice now? yeah, is, is quite loud. Oh, better now? Better, yeah. I was thinking about we were talking on the chat also on that. I think that the perception of the real world uh, can be disrupted to the materiality or the, the X reality. I mean, uh, sometimes the representation, uh, physical representation, uh, the twin is not enough. I mean, we can imagine sometimes to uh, create a full uh, shape of uh, 1,000 square meter to represent uh, a graphical cardboard, for example. So we can uh, split the real world and is a uh, digital representation to make the digital representation even better to understand for human people. Maybe we will go the next uh, years in a, a representation that brings more value than the digital representation for some cases. So like this, I can, for example, like 10 people optimize a graphical cardboard in um, uh, say you're gaming way of doing things. I mean, 1,000 square meter uh, places, uh, one part dedicated to the graphical processor, uh, another part dedicated to uh, uh, the fan or something like that. that was, uh, it was just a about it. There is an interesting question in the chat uh, about the ideal data pipeline for digital twin. Do you have uh, something to say about what could be ideal? Kevin, Caroline? Yeah, um, what we use, uh, and sometimes, as we said, it depends on how you, you, you get definition of the word, but data pipeline we use, um, we think, in, in the way our client produces the solutions, um, Google Analytics gives you a great view or overview of um, the ROI and KPIs. So every solution that we make, we plug it into Google Analytics. But it's not only about the pipeline, it's how you um, get information, how you, you understand them. Because as I explained in my presentation, the, the data from uh, 360 or uh, VR are not used the same way as from a normal website or video. So the, the data has, has to be really taken uh, avec des pincettes. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, carefully. It's, yeah, carefully because it's, uh, it's not easy to, to understand these data because they're really different from uh, normal data. They are uh, explained the same way. So a bounce rate in virtual tool or a VR or a website is still a bounce rate, but it doesn't give you the same information. So it's not about the pipeline, but how you understand the data, I think. Maybe, Caroline? Uh, 
Any other questions in the meantime? Maybe uh, th there is a question uh, related to the the actual crisis. Okay, it, we asked this question on every panel, in fact, in this edition of Laval Virtual. But do you think that the actual crisis, the lockdown, and something like that could, how can I say, help the help to spread the use of uh, digital twin for, for example, maintenance? or training it could be enough ah, welcome back kevin yes yeah, sorry uh, i don't know what happened um can i answer the question because I, I think it was really interesting yeah we are in a very strange period now and yeah. uh, on every panel we are talking about the well potential actual crisis yes. potential for uh, XR mainly but as for digital twin we can say the same thing it's a uh, maybe an opportunity to see the digital twin spread in many industries and much more uh, fastly than we can imagine okay um what we experience right now is a massive demand on again how can i disrupt my business and make it work online so which means digital twins are a way of uh, promoting your business online and uh, we definitely see that there is an increasing in the business right now because um, big companies they, they always get the input uh, are now wondering did what we did uh, was enough and most of the time the answer is no and most of the time, what they did was only doing technology for technology. And now they are more wondering about what can we do as a, a real thing, which will help us to still have our business working online and also working physically. So yeah, COVID is actually helping um, all the digital technologies, VR, XR, MR, uh, AR, and all of that um, due to COVID. So hopefully it will help people to get more conscious about the way that these technologies can actually help them and help their business, even in e-learning and all of that. But don't do it only for the technology purposes. Do it because you have a need and because you think it will help your business. Thank you. Okay, I think we can. Uh, we, we are going to, to conclude this panel if we don't have any other question. Feel free to to write something, but just want to know. Oh, if you can respond. <laughs> um, imagine in what in the next five years, what could you could you could you think of a very very good thing? For the evolution of uh, of the digital wheel, what can uh, what can we imagine in only short uh, future? Kevin, you can start. Well, do you mean about like uh, what kind of technology? Uh, more than technology, uh, technology and uses. Uh, what can what, what we want? What you want, in fact? Oh. <laughs> the only thing is I, I want people to be more conscious about that that these tools are really useful and they have to uh, get conscious about the fact that they need it. And it's not about do you need it? Now it's about you have to do it. And uh, it's good to want to do it, but now do it. Because mo most companies, they, they think about it, they, they, they think a lot, they, you know, uh, think about the project and finally it takes years and years and at the end of the day they go like well maybe we will do it next year so now covid um you should have been prepared uh with your company uh we we, we couldn't prepare covid but you should have been prepared as a massive crisis and having a digital twin online but most companies are not so now uh, please be aware that you have to, to to be ready for that because it's going to happen more so be conscious, be aware, and um, 
And again, don't do things for technology purposes. Do things because you think it will really help your business, your people, your employees, and all of that. It is a really wise conclusion. Uh, just, Johan, could you want to... Yeah, I, I will try. I don't know if you can hear me well. Yeah, we can hear you. What's your vision ah, the for results. the future? Ne near future. Uh, optimistic on the impact on remote operation it's the right in terms of sustainability i think the next years we will be able and we are learning with COVID period that we are able to do the same thing uh, more efficiently i think that's uh we uh, like to see the the so I'm sorry, I wish for the next edition in the near future a better sound quality and maybe a, a better connection between between all of us. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> and we see that in the chat, uh, Johan said a, a good, a, a very, very interesting word, word which is sustainability, uh, thanks to XR. And, uh, it's linked to standard discussion and something like that. So maybe we can uh, can book a meeting next year on the Laval virtual. I think in Laval. Well, I hope in Laval to talk about uh, one more year in the XR domain and in the digital twin users. And maybe adding what did COVID period add to all the solutions and did client want something more than what they usually want? Yeah. Thank you, Johan. Thank you, Erin. And thank you, Caroline. Sorry, Caroline has disappeared again. But thank you. Thank you, Hall. Uh, it's the, it was the last uh, session of the Laval Virtual Con Professional Conferences.